hey, this debate's about to start. But in case you didn't know, it's also available on our Modern Day Debate podcast right now in case you want to listen to it on the go. So here is that debate right now. Hey, everybody. Today we're debating whether or not veganism devalues human life. And we are starting right now with our omnivore team, Martin and Justice. Thanks so much for being with us. The floor is all yours. Hey there, everyone. Glad to be here. Thank you very much, James. Thank you to Modern Day Debate and to the Annoying Vegans for uh, <laughs> uh, doing this with us today. It's going to be great. Uh, thank you also, Martin, my teammate, for, uh, mm-hmm. you know, making the choice to do this thing with me. I, As we agreed, Martin, I'm going to jump in here. My name is Justice Walker. I am a missionary, farmer, father of three, home educator, husband, um, and generally the vegan's worst nightmare. I have a farm with uh, 60 milk goats, 100 sheep, three horses. So I use all kinds of, every form of animal exploitation known to man. I am vehemently and radically uh, opposed to veganism as an ideology. And I have a little statement here that I'll read and try to give those reasons for that. My reasons for affirming that veganism devalues human life and is in fact a noxious and pernicious philosophy are myriad. However, for the sake of time and convenience, I have organized my main objections into four basic categories. They are moral, practical, philosophical, or logical, and personal. First, moral. The biblical worldview provides us with a framework in which to view questions of morality. When we abandon this framework, we end up not only supporting positions that are emotionally driven, inconsistent, and logically unsupportable, but are harmful to human well-being and even threaten our existence. I am not against veganism as a diet choice or even as a protest against the abuses of animals uh, of animals in factory farms, but I am strongly, even radically against veganism as a moral position. Humans are unique. Extending moral considerations which are unique to humans by including in the moral cohort non-human animals on the logical foundation that they share some specific traits with us does nothing by way of of ennobling them, but does great harm to the dignity of humans. Humans are unique because we were made in the image of God. Humans were set over nature to subdue, that is to harness it for our use and to care for it, that is to improve upon it. By abusing animals or driving species into extinction, into extinction, by ending by eroding topsoils or poisoning groundwater, we not only demonstrate a lack of care for the earth and her non-human inhabitants, but we also preach heresy through our actions. Professing to be the image of God, we destroy what God called good. However, on the other hand, by mislabeling the killing of animals for food, murder. We also devalue human life and dignity by making humans have equal value with animals. How many chickens is one human life worth? How many dogs? How many cats? My opponents will undoubtedly rebuff they do not claim humans are animals to have equal value per se. I hope to demonstrate that they actually do equate humans with animals. Arguing for veganism from the basic from the basis of animal rights or promoting veganism as the new abolitionist movement is a case in point. They would have us believe that the fight to free animals from their abuse as a prime uh, human food source is equatable to the fight for freeing slaves. Some will point out that certain early abolitionists were also animals rights activists, again, in air quotes. In fact, they misread history by reading into the record their own modern humanist biases. William Wilberforce, one of the great champions of the abolitionist cause, also fought for laws guaranteeing the humane treatment of animals. But not because these animals had rights, but because, as I laid out earlier, mistreating the creation is a dishonor to the creator and thus belittles the dignity of the image of God. The early abolitionists support Uh, sought to free the slaves because they too were human. They sought to guarantee the humane treatment of animals as a reminder for humans to act in a human way. Extending imaginary rights to animals devalues 
the very concept of rights and is a dishonor to the memory of the great men and women who fought to extend those rights to all humans as well as devaluing and cheapening the suffer, suffering of the hum, that humans underwent when those rights were denied. My second category is practical. Modern far, farming is, an unsustainable, is unsustainable largely because of the bifurcation of animal and plant husbandry. The modern, the modern drive for a fully chemically-based farming practice is, is not only destroying groundwater and eroding topsoil, but is driving us to a completely unsustainable form of food production. The last 10,000 years of human existence, ever since the agrarian revolution, animals and animal and plant husbandry together have been the basis for all human thriving and for sustainable practices of agriculture. This will have to be something that we return to in the future and not something that we move away from. When vegans advocate for an entirely plant-based diet, they are also advocating for the destruction of nature. They also do this based on what is called a weird Western educated, industrialized, um, uh, rich and democratic perspective, otherwise known as white Western European, because they, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, I lost my place, because they have a diet that is that is allowed to them due to mechanized industrialized farming practices, which are not available to most of the rest of the world. Inconsistency, this is my third point. Vegans have yet to demonstrate that the burden of of the, the moral burden applies to people who buy animal products. Um, the example that I'd like to, to show here is if you were to back in the 1830s, again, with the, with the um, example of slavery, if you were to say that someone who bought a cotton shirt was 100% uh, at fault or, or was responsible for the propagation of slavery, um, you'd have to show that the promotion of that the buying of the cotton shirt was was absolutely inherently connected to slavery. We would know that you can totally produce cotton slavery. Therefore, even though the majority of shirts were produced at that time with slavery, it still doesn't follow that cotton shirt procuration is necessarily evil. Um, this is a point that we'll have to revisit. Um, and then the final point, I actually had my first whole big section written out, and the rest I'm ad libbing. So sorry about if this is coming off a little bit, a little bit hitchy. Uh, is personal. When I moved to my current farm five years ago, from the far north of Siberia down to the south of Siberia, I was bitten in the very early uh, first spring of the first year by four different ticks, and I somehow was so lucky as to attract three different diseases, tick-borne diseases, Lyme's, meningitis, and um, encephalitis. The results of these, of these tick bites were absolutely devastating to my health. I spent almost three years completely on my back, 16 hours a day, 18 hours a day. I had to sleep. I was I had the shakes. I was vomiting, even from small stress or small work, um, small amounts of stress or work until I finally found a diet that helped cure my disease. The diet was the carnivore diet. Um, I didn't jump on it because it was a fad, but because other survivors of Lyme's disease had uh, promoted it to me or had advocated it to me. And so I decided to check it out. After six months of eating nothing but hamburgers, actually mostly goat and sheep burgers, because that's the kind of farmer I am, um, I completely got rid of all of the Lyme's and encephalitis symptoms, which had been haunting me for um, th for three years. I've been able to regain my health and my life, and I'm glad to say that this is due to uh, my good friends, the animals that gave their lives to help me regain my health. So this is my fourth reason is personal. Um, I also see that people like me who live in um, less privileged parts of the world, like Siberia, Russia, or all of Southeast Asia that's just below the border here, um, do not have the privilege as Western people do to even have this idea of a full vegan diet. Um, they live a more natural uh, dietary life. 
like our ancestors have for the last at least 10,000 years with both mixed animal and plant diets as we were intended uh, to have. So those are my four things. Martin, if I want to kick it over to you and uh, you can uh, okay. bring, up, Thanks, bring up the rest um, of the stuff. I'm, I'm just going to uh, put this um, beautiful dog on you so that the vegans don't get angry at me um, because I'm probably going to offend them. <laughs> so uh, James just fixed that so that uh, they can see me, uh, the little doggy. Um, okay. What I want to say is um, I think d veganism can be dangerous if you take it to uh, the extremes. Um, if you take it to extreme, then uh, you would care so much about animals that you would kill yourself because that's the least amount of pain you can uh, give animals. Um, because everything uh, uh, gives animals pain. Even vegan food foods causes massive amounts of suffering and pain to animals. Um, so... They say that if you rebuke a wise man, they will love you. So hopefully the vegans will love me off me after this debate, me and justice. Um, so what I also want to say, how many minutes do I have still left? Like, uh, James, are you still there? Uh, it's about three I can't minutes. Hear you, James. <clears throat> it's about three minutes, about three minutes okay. left. Okay. Okay. I think, um, if you if you show a person enough videos of animals suffering, then they would uh, I think join vegans. The same way you can brainwash a guy person into um, what if you w watch enough people suffering, you show the person how much people suffer and how many times they cry and how many people kill themselves. Um, so uh, then that person would also think it's like evil to bring a child into this world, that it's like child abuse to bring a child into this world. So I think veganism is also like to that extreme. I think luckily most vegans are not super extreme uh, obsessed with animal suffering. Um, now, English is not my first language. So <laughs> uh, Afrikaans is actually my first language. So hopefully I don't uh, say something wrong. Um, and um, so the other point I wanted to make that uh, just existing already causes uh, animal suffering. And I don't agree um, that animals are worth uh, one human being, like one animal is worth one human being. And I also don't agree that uh, killing an animal is murder. I don't think that follows logically. Um, I think humans are like much more valuable than animals, many times more valuable. Like I would kill many lions to protect Anna and Brian, many, many. So I don't think they are like worth one bug or one chicken. Um, and thus, I, I don't agree that uh, veganism uh, increases a, a, a human health or I think it decreases um, a, a human value. Um, so that's, that's what I want to say. And I, I give the rest of my time to um, the vegans. You got to thank you very right. much from our Omnivore team. And want to let you know, folks, if it's your first time here at Modern Day Debate, we are a neutral platform hosting debates on science, religion, and politics. And we hope you feel welcome no matter what walk of life you are from. Vegan, omnivore, black, white, gay, straight, you name it, folks. We're glad you're here. And we also want to let you know, our guests are linked in the description. We really do appreciate our guests. So we want to encourage you to attack the argument, not the person. And so with that, Anna and Brian... Thanks for being with us. The floor is all yours. Thank you, James. Uh, thank you to Justice and Martin for uh, challenging us to this debate and having us here today uh, to kick off the debate again. Um, I mean, our response to the debate proposition is fairly simple. This will be pretty short. Uh, veganism is most currently defined as simply a way of life that seeks to exclude all animal exploitation and cruelty towards animals as far as what is possible and practicable. Uh, an older definition of veganism is simply the doctrine that man should live without exploiting animals. Um, and we were honestly surprised to be challenged to this debate with this particular debate proposition, given that veganism does not concern itself with the valuing or devaluing of humans in any way. Um, if you just look at the word value, Merriam-Webster defines the word value in its verb form um, as to consider or rate highly or to rate or scale in usefulness, importance, or general worth. So by devaluing, uh, we assume our interlocutors to mean 
That would be to consider or rate humans poorly or to consider humans unuseful, unimportant, or worth less. Uh, but simply standing up for the rights of cows, pigs, and chickens, for example, is it's not inherent that one would have to devalue Homo sapiens to do that. Just as when someone stands up for the rights of women, for example, it is not entailed that one would have to devalue men. Uh, veganism, by definition, is a non-human animal rights movement. Its focus is on the exploitation of non-human, living, sentient beings for mere taste pleasure. It is the belief that, for all of the same reasons that we believe that our fellow human beings deserve not to be exploited, our fellow non-human earthlings also deserve not to be exploited. Right, and uh, for those unfamiliar Veganism stands firmly against speciesism, which is simply discrimination based on species. And it, it's really no different than racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, or any other type of discrimination based on morally irrelevant factors. Just as treating someone differently because they have different amounts of melanin in their skin, it's equally wrong to treat someone differently because they have feathers instead of hair or hooves instead of feet. In all of the ways that matter ethically, like the ability to feel joy, to feel pain, the ability to suffer, sentient animals and humans are very much alike. Veganism in no way devalues human life or the human experience. On the contrary, veganism empowers and encourages our fellow humans to live in alignment with our own values rather than blindly accept the indoctrinated societal hypocrisy of speciesism. And that's, that's it. Mm -hmm. You got it. Thank you very much to our vegan team. And also folks want to let you know, we are absolutely thrilled for this upcoming juicy debate at the bottom right of your screen. Folks, you don't want to miss this one. Lance from the Surfs and JF will be debating socialism versus capitalism this upcoming Wednesday. So be sure to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on that epic debate. It's going to be a blast. And so with that, we're going to jump into the open conversation. Thanks to our guests, who once again, folks, are linked in the description. And with that, the floor is all yours. Okay, can I go first? Sure. I, I want to ask uh, uh, Anna and uh, Brian, uh, how 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 many animals is James worth? Like, I want to know um, it, James's life. How many animals is he worth? I I don't know that that can really be answered. That would be like saying how many other humans is James' life worth? One, right. easy. So you would kill one person to save James? If that person. Uh, um, killed uh, tried to kill james yes but i'm talking about but say what if two um, people two... tried to kill james what if three no, people I'm, were trying to kill no, james no i'm i'm talking about say two pe uh, say james is drowning and there's a, a lot of animals on the other side you can only save uh, one side which would you save uh, how many animals before you uh, start saving um, the animals instead of james that's not the situation that we're faced with when we go to the grocery store and buy meat it's it's kind of moot it's like you're, you're creating a false dichotomy. The, the, the choice isn't, do I save James or do I save this a, cow? It's, do I just go pay to kill But it's not cow? a false dichotomy because, but, but, but it's not a false dichotomy because the veganist position in general on, for instance, uh, experimentation with animals for medical research is that we shouldn't experiment with animals for medical research. But that is a direct save the animals or save the person um, issue. It, it's not a false dichotomy. It's a thought experiment that has actually played out in everyday life. There are many things we do to animals that are horrible, and we hope to move away from those things, just like we've moved away from horse-drawn carriages in some parts of the world to cars, or we've, uh, you know, we, we've done away with pagers, and, and we have cell phones now. You know, like it's we hope to evolve past that point, and we know that many medical research companies, many schools, including who used to uh, uh, force children to dissect uh, fetal pigs and uh, frogs, for example, are now moving to software or other modes of research. 
So, I mean, there are, there is still room for evolution in that area. Um, We are aware that many of our modern medicine, medical achievements have been because of animal research, because that's all we had, that's all we knew. But, you know, we, we want to move away from that. I mean, that's where the words possible and practical come into effect in the definition of veganism. You know, as Martin was saying, if you take veganism to its extreme, you would just end up taking your own life so that you cause zero harm. That's not veganism because that's not possible. Or I mean, it's possible. It's not practicable. It's not a practicable message to be spreading. Obviously, simply by existing, you're going to cause some harm. Mm-hmm. Veganism is about reducing that harm as best as you can, as far as what's possible and practicable. And for the majority of people, especially people living in Western countries who buy their food at a grocery store or go to restaurants, um, they're totally able to just move their right hand a little bit to the right and grab the oat milk instead of the cow milk. They're capable of doing that. It's possible. It's practical. They can do it. So that's it's killing what we're an animal to. murder. Is killing an animal murder, in your opinion? Well, by definition, it's murder. Murder has many. Okay, should they go to jail uh, for killing an animal? A lot of people actually, well, animal abuse in the U.S. Uh, is now a felony. Yeah, it is illegal to uh, like certain, abuse and kill a dog. Certain yeah. animals, that's the thing, you know. Okay, so people should go to jail for killing animals. I think that right now, if you were to implement a law that says, if you kill a pig and eat the pig, you go to jail. I don't think people would agree to that law. I don't think it would make it into the legal system. I don't think it's an effective way to try to force people to change their behavior through law. What we're trying to do is get people to change their hearts and their minds about the behaviors that they're engaging in. And as our hearts and minds and our opinions change, our laws will reflect the opinions of the society. But the word murder does have many definitions. One definition being to wantonly slay or to wantonly kill. Wantonly just means intentionally. So to intentionally kill is a definition is one definition of murder. So by definition, yes, killing an animal to eat the animal is murder. Okay, if you are on an island uh, and you have to stay alive, you have to kill animals to stay alive. Uh, would you do that? But We're not on not, an island, Martin. No, are... but I'm I'm asking. I'm asking. How much are you worth? <laughs> like I would say, you're worth thousands of animals because you can stay alive on that island as long as you want. But you can kill as many animals as you island. want. We're not in an on an island. We're not. Rarely are people in a position uh, of of being stuck on an island and having to. That's actually a reality show. You know, we we create yeah. those situations, but most people are dealing with the decision of what to pick out at the grocery store. I mean, you're you're baking the answer into yeah, the question itself. Instance, I, I just uh, but, the only reason I'm asking this is I want to realize how to much you're worth here, Martin, as a human. Martin, yeah. just just real. Just real quick to interject again to bring this back from a thought experiment down to something real. I was stranded on an island called Lyme's disease, um, and it was a very real island. And it, I was on it for three, three plus years, and I couldn't get up out of my bed for 16 to 18 hours a day. And anytime I tried to do any kind of physical work, I was shaking and vomiting and, and having all kinds of other symptoms. I tried all kinds of different various kinds of medicines. And the only answer for me was six months of animal protein. And that is not a thought experiment of if you were on an island. That is my life. I was on that island. Um, And I did get off via, you know, eating animals. So this is not something that's, again, Martin's bringing up a point that that is not a, uh, a... Sorry. I was just saying our point is that most people don't uh, have that situation. So you're using a fringe situation to justify the norm. The norm is everyday people go to McDonald's or they go to the grocery store or they go wherever to a restaurant and they buy animal products that were factory farmed. That's the norm. Now, if you're telling me that you tried everything, you consulted with plant-based physicians, you consulted with non-plant-based physicians, you tried various medications, you tried this and that, and the only possible way somehow was that eating nothing but red meat, like a carnivore, like a lion, 
that was the only possible, like in a universe where that's the only possible way to fix your health issue, then I'm sure you, then I'm sure you did everything that you could. And that's again, possible and practicable, but we're not talking about people that were in your condition. We're talking about yeah. average shoppers. Just like, you know, people bring up like, what about yeah. the, and it, and it, that's, that's, that's not what we're talking about. So we're talking again, about I'm, people who, have the choice, who can make that choice. And again, I'm, and again, I'm coming back to that. This is not just a fringe case. Uh, the, according to the CDC in the United States alone, over 30,000 people uh, are infected with Lyme's disease every year. And carnivore diet has been demonstrated. Again, we don't have a, you know, control group studies to show this, but anecdotally my own life experience and a lot of people who I know who I've reached out to who also have Lyme's disease shows that a three to six month carnivore diet will relieve you not only of symptoms, but of the disease altogether. This is 30,000 cases a year. So in the, I don't know how long you guys have been vegan, five, six, seven years, that's anywhere between 150 to 210,000 people um, in the only the time that you guys you know, I've been promoting veganism who have a disease that has been demonstrated to be cured by the use of animal products. And again, you know, the, the question that I'm here is that in previous debates, I've, you know, heard you guys advocate for a moral position on veganism. Is this just a harm reduction? We can talk about that. But as far as a moral position, we don't eat people or kill people because it's, you know, practicable. And that's why the, the, the loose use of the term murder is, is devaluing to human life. Um, we kill animals, we, mur- mur- we murder people. And that's, and, and that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. By definition, killing an animal demonstrating. is murder. It's just, it's just the well, definition. By definition, Let me clarify, there were a couple in, in, the English, we... in the English language, like Steve, just to, in just the to English sure. language. Well, I'll give you another like 10 seconds mm-hmm. to wrap up. And then we've got to kick it over just to hear from Anna and Brian yeah. as well. Absolutely, Anna, and I did not mean to interrupt, but I just wanted to finish this thing but about the murder. But in the English language, like in a lot of ancient languages, unlike, for instance, in Russian, we have two different words for a reason. Murder means the killing of one human by another human. That is its basic definition, and that's what defines it from killing. All right, let's give a few minutes. Go ahead, Anna and Brian. Well, I wanted to, we wanted to touch on your initial point about the 30,000 people who are diagnosed with Lyme disease every year. That's um, in the U.S., right? In the U.S. Okay. I mean, there's only in the U.S. So 30,000, there's 320 or 350 million people in the United States. 30,000 is like less than 1%, like 0. 0.0 per year. So we're not Right. That so that's not a common a thing. That's not a normal thing. That, that's a fringe example. Um, not saying that it's not saying it's, it's any, not valid. It's any less important. We're right. just saying that as as it would, the norm, the majority would be what we would consider a norm. Um, but for those thirty thousand people, would you say that they were doing something wrong by by treating their disease through a carnivore diet? It's like we said, I mean, if you're, if you've exhausted every single other plant-based method that you can think of, and the only possible thing that works for you is this, then that is what it is. It's the same. It, you're basically doing the same thing as Martin, which is like, you're baking the answer into the question, which is if you had no other choice, but to harm this animal to survive, would you do it? It's like, well, yes, you've just baked it into the question. I have no other choice. I mean, yeah. But the difference is, is that if you were putting me into a lifeboat scenario where the only other choice I had was to sacrifice my own life or to murder another human being, I would say I'll, I'll willingly die for that other human. And that's the difference between murder and killing. And that's the difference between the leaving animals in their proper position on the value scale. And when you don't do that, it devalues human life. What's the proper position? What, what, I mean, do you, I, okay, so moving on to that, because I think you're, you did touch on the biblical aspect and the moral framework. Um, animals' proper position is, is what to be, to be less than in your, in your yeah. opinion? Less, animals have less value than humans. 
that's just that is a according that's axiomatic to in my worldview. Yes, of course, and even according to you, uh, because again, like the, like what I said with a lifeboat scenario, you are not going to give me. I I mean, because you guys are are decent human beings, you're not going to give me a situation in a lifeboat scenario where you're like, oh, it's okay to murder people. It's just well, it's just as practical. At least I hope you wouldn't. But in the scenario with animals, you're willing to do that. But you kind of talk both sides out of both sides of your mouth in that. Oh no, humans are animals. We wouldn't want to harm them. We wouldn't want to cause them any harm or use them as food because that would be a murder. And that's what I'm saying is that by by because having that not... fuzziness of terms is is devaluing to human life. It is. It is not because we we simply advocate for the unnecessary killing of animals. I mean, animals well, against it. Or ag- against. Advocate against it. Yeah, yeah. didn't say against. Against. We advocate against the unnecessary killing of animals, murder, what have you. Um, and you're using scenarios where it's needed to justify situations where it's need less. Right. Most people here in this neighborhood, in the city, and in many parts of the world, the 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 choices that they make three times a day as to like what to put on their plates or who to put on their plates is a choice that they can make, a choice that they like they can they can choose plant-based or they can choose uh, a victim. I mean animals by nature, any animal in the wild fights for their life. That's just the biological necessity of survival is is to survive. So extend that to all of all species. No animal wants to die. We are forcing them to die for personal whatever taste pleasure or or uh, imagined necessity. So I mean that's that's yeah, all we're but saying. The, but the vast vast more the vast majority of the population of the planet Earth, you know, more than 50% don't eat animal protein for simple taste pleasure. It's part a necess, necessary part of their diet. So what you're saying is, is that your position is no longer a moral position, but simply a uh, very tentative harm reduction uh, position for the inhabitants of the golden billion. It's, it's the same. I mean, we can just move it over into the human context. We have no need to kill human beings on a daily basis, right? But if a human being were trying to kill you, I would imagine if you had no other choice, you might kill that person before they get a chance to kill you. That doesn't mean you can just go killing human beings day to day because in these fringe examples, it's a matter of life and death. You're bringing up life and death and fringe examples to justify uh, non-life and death and non-fringe day-to-day life. No, 50% it's, of it's the a planet, weird 50 Fifty percent of the planet isn't a fringe example. Fifty uh, percent of the planet you have. The planet consumes meat because they. How do you define? Where's that number coming from? Because because fifty percent of the planet still live in rural contexts in non-industrialized countries and mixed animal and plant husbandry is the foundation for all their basic dietary needs. This is a, just a simple reality. Um, when you try to, I mean, I don't I mean, like to know where the number as a farmer, is. yeah, because as a well, you can look at the urbanization rates um, on the planet. We're just just barely tipping fifty percent. I come from um, a country and, where the, most of the country is rural, and it's always been until the westernized, you know, fast food stuff started to appear. It was mostly plant based. That's what that's what's well, I mean, affordable to grow. I mean, I still have cousins who say that go, going to buy meat in the city is very expensive. They yeah, they never do it because they're growing. They're growing. Don't get me wrong. Growing. Yeah, don't get me wrong. Don't, don't get me wrong, Anna. When I talk about animal protein, I'm not talking about hamburgers or steak. That, of course, is a a vestige of you know big you know high range texas australia <laughs> that's not the way normal people eat but having a chicken who lays you eggs having a goat who gives you milk having a sheep who gives you a couple lambs a year that you use very very sparingly in soups 
um, to feed your children, make sure they get the right amount of protein that they need is, is not the same thing as a hamburger in McDonald's. And that is the experience of a large percentage of the population of the earth. That's outside of the golden billion, outside of those who live in Europe and the United States and the few other non um, European centric, uh, you know, industrialized, highly industrialized countries. And, and I, so for instance, you know, the villages that surround me here in Russia, almost everyone uh, in the village has a mixed animal and plant-based, uh, you know, subsistence farm that is necessary for their survival. Almost all of them have chickens, all of them have goats or sheep, cows. This is a normal part of the human condition. And it's normal because raising a 100% plant-based diet um, by the sweat of your brow is almost impossible. And it's, it's not only impossible, it's impracticable for uh, soil erosion, for deple depletion of groundwater, for you know the chemical poisoning of the earth and this is something that western people are going to have to fess up to if if you don't want to run out of you know topsoil in the next 20 years right um, I mean, just on so that because i know you brought up environment like animal agriculture is responsible for about 80 to 90 percent of water consumption in the u.s mm -hmm. i mean growing and and then growing the feed for that livestock it's over, it's almost 60% of water that is used for growing feed for livestock. That could be used for humans. Speaking of devaluing humans, you know, we could mm -hmm. be using that land to feed humans, not to feed animals, to then feed humans, because that's, I mean, the, the environmental impact that that is having I mean, they tell us here in California, oh, to, uh, to when, when every single year when we have a drought, take shorter showers, don't water your gardens. All while along the I-5, you have miles and miles and miles of factory farms where these cows are consuming gallons, hundreds of thousands of gallons every single year yeah. of water. Yeah, I, I am in no, in no way uh, in any case or in any shape here to defend the practices of factory farming as practiced in the West. Like that is absolutely, you're not, you're not finding a friend of them in me. The problem like, is that's what we that's need. No that's what people, the, the demand for, for animal products is such that there is no other way to fulfill that demand. If not through factory farming, the demand it's is not, what it's, it's actually, it's actually, it's actually not true. The switch from the mixed animal and plant-based production um, of the human diet in the United States, in particular, specifically the United States, that happened in the 1960s due to the McGovern lobby and the change from small farms to the, the get, get bigger, get out syndrome that happened in the 1960s. The, the big switch happened largely due to, to government subsidies. It had nothing to do with the demand. There was no great demand for the local milkman to go out of business. But when we started subsidizing massive corn production, it drove down the price of corn, which made um, containment and factory farming the, the, the big, uh, what are they called, the, the, the feedlots possible. And it wasn't the demand for hamburgers. It was the, the subsidization of corn specifically that makes that possible. So this is not, this is, again, you're putting the onus on the consumer when the onus is not on the, should not be on the consumer. You're, you're confusing cause with effect here when, when it goes from that. And again, like I'm, again, I'm not, I'm here not, I'm not here to defend factory farming. The bifurcation or the, the, the splitting of, of animal husbandry and plant husbandry in the modern Western food production system is is an abomination. Like it is a huge problem. I'm not, I'm not, but, but I, what I'm saying is that the, the position the vegans say, say is, Oh, look at the, the, the sins of uh, factory farming and they're myriad, lots of sins. And so we should just get rid of animal food altogether. That doesn't follow because to, to stop soil erosion, to use less water, we need to bring those systems back together because they are symbiotic and they always have been. I mean, you're, so you're advocating for few, for more farmers to farm smaller farms rather than the factory farms. The problem with that is, as you were saying earlier, like some people don't want to be farmers for a living. Like 
people want to go to the grocery store and just buy their meat and cheese for cheap. And when you were talking about subsidies, I thought you were going to talk about the government, the billions spent on meat and dairy subsidies, which also artificially lowers the price of meat and dairy, which then creates this idea that meat and dairy are, are cheap. And as Anna said, the demand is absolutely that's and, the only way to a, fulfill that demand. And as a, one and second, as a dairy sure farmer, that, just, I totally right, agree. Just with to be you. sure that get rid of listen, the, justice, the dairy subsidies. Justice, stop for a second. It, just to be sure that Brian, were you maybe there's a lag on your side? That is so. so mm-hmm. Pardon my uh, being so candid. But were you guys? Were you done with your point, Brian? Just wanted to be sure. Just before we. No, we thanks, James. Okay, I mean, we're sure. pretty much done with the point. The the point was just that demand for these products is what drives their production, and so. 99% of all animal foods in the United States are factory farmed. And when you tell the average consumer, when you go to the grocery store and you buy a gallon of milk, guaranteed, guaranteed, there was a baby cow that died and a mother cow that died just so you could have this milk that was intended for the baby cow. Would you maybe consider changing your buying habits? If people can't understand that their demand is what causes that to happen, I mean, that, that's, that's what I don't understand about your argument. You're saying that the consumers have no responsibility for buying a product, even when they know where the product comes from. I think there is responsibility on the consumer side. Go ahead, Justice. Thanks for your patience. The, and yeah, James, and I was just, inter- I getting a little bit heated here. I was just interjecting with, with, uh, you know, vegans that I, <laughs> I agree with them, like kill the subsidies for milk. Sure. Absolutely. Kill the subsidies for beef. Like, uh, food should be more expensive across the board. Like that is an absolute thing. We'd all be healthier and better served if food is more expensive w- without question. Like, but as far as the consumers go and, and everything, it's a, again, you artificially decrease the price of food and then you blame the consumer for consuming things that are artificially cheaper. Like that doesn't follow. Again, the people bear responsibility who artificially lower the cost of food. Um, also, another thing is, I, again, going back to my the, the little example that I tried to put in about the cotton shirt, like cotton shirts are not are not immoral just because they're cotton shirts. Yes, you know, if you were in 1830, the very the big chance that your cotton shirt was made using slave uh, labor was pretty high. But it doesn't mean that cotton shirts, in any case in all the world, are immoral. Like it just means that. We should get rid of slavery, not we should get rid of cotton shorts. And the same thing here is we should get rid of fam- far, uh, factory farming. We should get rid of the the amazing abuses that happen in the factory farming context. We should get back to more mixed animal plant husbandry style farms that are modern and no, they would not require everyone to be a farmer. That's not that's not the requirement there. I think your um, example is a little. But, but again, Sorry, I wanted to jump in there and say I think that example is not a great comparison because a cotton shirt is an inanimate object made out of a non-sentient plant. So the product is a plant-based product. The way that it was produced in the 1800s was via slave labor. We fast forward to today, a hamburger is made from a victim, a living sentient being who was killed in order to make this product. And yes, this victim was also probably abused and tortured and mistreated throughout his very short life and then murdered at the age of one or two uh, for a hamburger that someone doesn't need. They just like the taste of it. So you're comparing a non-sentient plant-based product to a sentient animal product. It's not a great comparison. The reason why I bring up that comparison is because I'm trying to demonstrate the difference between a practical consideration of trying to advance um, kind of humane treatment of, of, slaves or humane treatment of animals and the position that I think you're taking, which is a moral position. And again, like you've already demonstrated in this conversation, you don't necessarily believe that eating animals is immoral. Um, we do. So when it's needless. Then yes, again, so, but uh, as, like I said, we, we're still living on a planet where around 50% of the population of the planet, not of the West, not of your weird context, Western educated, industrialized, um, and, you know, democratic, uh, you know, that the rich and democratic, 
not not that context the context of the majority of the world are you know still the the, the large majority of the world is not what you're saying where the, that's an option a large portion of people who live in third world countries eat plant-based by necessity because animal products are so expensive but yeah, like plant-based diets are pretty third, abundant most, in many countries I know they're almost ex, they're almost ex, they're almost they're they're outside of strict you know strict buddhists they're almost non-existent in non-western countries um you'll you'll be hard pressed to find a, a native diet that is strictly plant-based hard pressed why couldn't you have a diet that's plant-based if you lived in a rural area why can't you eat vegetables and fruit and grains and legumes and all these other foods nuts and seeds like, why do you have because, to choose the animal product? Because outside of a because outside of a highly industrialized, why uh, does it need to be industrialized? System, how hard? I mean, we're just because it doesn't need to be a how processed hard is, vegan product. It's just a how plant. how 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 hard is raising you know uh, the necessary two two and a half thousand calories per day necessary for you know a human to live multiplied by three hundred sixty five. It's a lot of work. Like I've done it. Like we we grow we raise. All of our food, like 90 some percent of our food we raise on the farm, 50% of that is animal products, 50% of that is um, vegetable based. And the time that I spend on the, the, the overall time that we spend on producing food, the vegetable products are overwhelmingly the amount of time that we spend. Like, and if you, but you yourself that just said that most people to, don't need to farm and most people don't want to farm. Most people don't want to be their own farmers. So most people will be buying foods from farmers. They won't be farming it right. themselves. It won't be like this huge undertaking for them. They're just going to be buying potatoes and rice and beans. Right. And so if you had more farms like mine, for instance, or like Polyface farm, Farms uh, by Joel Salden in the United States, or permaculture farms like Geoff Lawton, the Australian, you know, god of permaculture, um, then you're, what you'll see is even in the context of, you know, even in, in a weird context in a Western industrialized, educated, rich and democratic country, you'll have the farms that can actually be sustainable, both economically and from a natural standpoint, are farms that will be both, that will be mixed. They'll be animal plant-based farms um, because that's how the cycle of nature works. And, and it allows for you to spend less time, produce more calories, but also to maintain a balance. And this is another thing. This is the impracticability of veganism. Vegan, if you want to go 100% vegan, you have, you have to go, if you want to go 100% vegan, you have to go for, chemical based farming which why? is destructive that's not that's because the case but you're talking about impractical when here you are i mean proposing an idea like how do we even that, that's what that documentary eating animals proposed too is that we return to the old ways of farming which is how how would we even get how would we even do that with the with the population, the population that, we have now. that yeah well, like I that's mean, not very practical. I mean, that's keeping why in mind that people don't want to be small scale farmers. Yeah. They just want to go buy yeah, cheap meat and cheese. It's very, it's very practical. Like, for instance, uh, me and the four families that live in my farm, we produce enough food um, for our, our little collective to work. And we also produce enough food for another 40 families. So, yeah, you wouldn't have the, uh, you wouldn't have the percentage of farmers to non-farmers that we have today, but it's not like every other person has to be a farmer. One, one out of 40 people would have to How be a farmer. How would you advocate? Um, and the way that you, the way you get there is simply by reducing subsidies. You reduce corn subsidies to begin with, and then you reduce, reduce um, say what? How do we reduce subsidies? How do we reduce subsidies? We try to educate people, not on a fanciful idea that veganism is going to change the world, but an idea that we stop pumping money into the depletion of the aquifer in Kansas and the erosion of topsoil in Wyoming um, and Nebraska and start paying for what we actually, for what we actually eat. The thing is, you know, just based on the activism that we tend to do, it is very difficult to convince people to do something that is so out of their realm of concreteness, like, which is why veganism is so empowering because we are literally telling people you can make a difference simply by what you eat. But if we mm -hmm. tell people about the 
the the water, the erosion in this yeah. state, in this state. Like there's no there's no direct connect. Most people don't have that 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 uh, interest, that ability mm-hmm. to connect with something that is so distant from their their immediate realm, their immediate reality in life. And the, you know, as I was saying, the power is in the hands of the consumer. So if you tell someone, hey, we got to get rid of these government subsidies, I don't know what people think they can do about that. But if you tell someone, hey, next time you go to buy some creamer for your coffee, try the oat creamer instead. It tastes the same. That's something someone yeah. can do. So eventually the government's and, not going to, like, subsidies are not going to make sense anymore. Mm-hmm. Why would they, why would you over, farmers are going to start wasting, mm-hmm. you know, product uh they're gonna that's why we advocate for veganism because as the demand falls farmers are not going to find the need to raise as many animals or produce as much milk because it's just going to all go to waste yeah and the the main destruction to nature that's happening for instance in the context again in the united states is due to corn and soy do you have evidence for that on a chemical basis do you have evidence for that yeah I, I don't have it right here. The majority of the destruction of the United States you, is being caused by the crops of corn. You're saying corn is destroying the United yeah. States. Who are we feeding the corn? When we talk about when we when we talk about the ecology, when we talk about soil erosion and the depletion of the aquifers, then yes, we're talking about corn. And why are we species. growing These so the much main, corn? The two and main soy things. Why are we growing so much corn and soy and wheat? Why are we? The reason why we're growing so much corn and soy and wheat is because back in the 1960s, we started to subsidize corn because it was unprofitable to grow it due to the massive amount of the water that it needed to take. And that lower price of corn due to subsidies so human beings is what are consuming a large pushed. amount of corn. One sec, just hear, just hear the, the rest of that sentence from uh, Justice. Yeah, human beings are actually consuming a large amount of corn, but the low price of corn is what pushed the feedlots to begin with. It's not, it's not the other way around. And so at, you say, I mean, and I do understand that the, the draw of veganism as an empowering thing. Like I understand that's that it, the pull that it has on that. But what I say is what's the, what's the end? The end is a sustainable agriculture that will not destroy the planet and that won't devalue human life. And that has to be mixed animal and vegetable production just it's the way it is in our in in our kind or we go down the route of the chemical uh based agriculture where you have you know a dead zone in the gulf of mexico half the size of texas like that's not what we want and so when you advocate for 100 percent animal-based uh products that's what you're advocating for and what i'm saying is, is there are like let's let's educate people on on mixed agriculture and something that's actually sustainable. That's number one. Number two, like Joel Saladin always says, shake the hand that feeds you, right? Find local sourced food. Start pr- pr- so start supporting those people who are in your territory, in your area, who are producing food. Like that's something that we can do that's very concrete. I'll give you a chance to respond, Anna and Brian. But then I also, after that, Martin, if you are still there and uh, willing. I'm still here. I'm waiting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I want to. Okay. Respond. Very, very anecdotally, as someone who has tried to find corn free chicken feed, um, it's pretty difficult because a lot of chicken feed is filled with corn. A lot of animal feed is filled with corn. That was my point. We're growing these fields and fields and fields of corn and soy and wheat to feed animals, to kill the animals, to eat the animals. That's vegans are not. Vegans are not eating corn on the cob all the time. Like, um, they have these spurts. <laughs> yeah, we're having a competition of crowing going on. But I, I mean, if I could, I would. I would like to bring it back to the actual debate challenge. The actual debate challenge that Justice challenged us with, which is the idea that animals should be treated with respect, somehow devalues human beings. I, I would like to bring it back around to the debate proposition if we could. All right, Martin, hit him. Okay. Um, hit him. So I think <laughs> veganism still devalues human life. So I want to know, is it evil for a human to eat honey? Because I know you don't eat honey. So is it evil? Evil for a human to eat honey? honey. Yes. 
I mean, honey take is honey from bees. animal exploitation. So yeah, so it's why, evil why in your opinion. When you don't need to. Is it evil? Let me see if I can bring... grab somebody? Yeah. Sorry, say that again. Sorry. Is it evil? Um, I mean, I don't know if it's evil. If you have the choice not to exploit honeybees and you choose to do it anyway, I would say that's unethical. No. So it's evil. Whoa. So sorry. So it's evil in your opinion. Okay. I didn't say it was evil. I said it was unethical. Okay, so bad. It's bad, yes. It's morally bad. Okay, so when does it become evil? When does... But why does it need to be I, evil? I mean, why does it need to be evil in order for it to is be Is killing wrong? an animal evil? Is killing an animal evil? Yeah. Do you need to kill the animal? For food. I, I want to eat some uh, food. Uh, I kill an animal. Is to, that evil? Martin, do you no, need I don't need to. Well, well then, so I don't need why to. would you kill I'm the evil. animal? No, I'm asking, is it evil? I think needlessly killing a living sentient being is wrong, yeah. And that for is food. Yes, needless, right? You could buy okay. something else, but you're choosing to buy the animal product. Okay, so God says everything that lives and moves about will be food for you, just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. So is God evil for allowing us to eat uh, animals? What so you're saying you eat animals because God told you to eat animals? God gives us the right to eat animals and it's not evil. So I'm asking, is God evil for allowing humans to eat animals? He and said, what's, your, what's your evidence for God? I mean, but everyone gets There's that. lots of evidence for massive amounts of but evidence. Can you gets, provide us with... Hold on. Everyone like, gets that quote wrong, first of all. <laughs> and I grew up Catholic, so I know. Genesis 129. I give you every seed-bearing plant that is upon all the earth and every tree that has seed-bearing fruit, they shall be yours for food. Yeah, and if you just read on, if you just read on, if you just read on, After then it says... The fall of man. Go, ahead, yeah. go ahead and finish on, I'll give you a chance to, and then we'll go come back to Martin. Okay, go. Yeah, I mean, I just think in order to claim that you're performing an act and it's, it's morally correct because God allows you to do that, then you would need to prove God's existence. Yeah, that can be a debate as well. But uh, like I first want to say, uh, let's so assume God you're, you're, is there. Is well, God no, evil? We're not going to assume God exists and tells us we can eat animals. That's you're providing an argument with no evidence, so we can dismiss your argument without evidence. Okay, Jesus existed. He ate animals. Is he evil for eating animals? I don't know that Jesus ever ate animals. All I have is a book that was written by not Jesus and not God to go off of. Yeah, I don't it's documented that he ate animals. Life. He ate I don't know so I don't... what Jesus did in his everyday life. I, I haven't talked to the man. I didn't know him personally. <laughs> there was a book written about him by other people. So we have okay, their so, work to go off of. So, so say Jesus existed and he ate the, you're, uh, animals. Dude, is he... you're, provi you're providing arguments with no evidence, and thus they will be dismissed without evidence. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's turn it back. How, how much is a human stage buds worth? How much is it worth? How much is a human, human taste bud? Taste buds. Uh, a human's taste bud. Say, say vegan food tastes like poop. How, but it doesn't. How, but it doesn't. Yeah, but say we. I'm trying to um, trying to figure out how much you uh, put the value on humans. Like, if you view uh, a human's taste buds as nothing compared, then you would say yes. Eat the, it's a moral obligation to eat poop uh, and not kill an animal. Yes, you're weighing taste pleasure over another human, uh, over another living being's existence. So I would say another living being's sentient existence is more important than your taste buds. Yeah, 100%. Okay, so so our taste buds is uh, not worth that. I think our taste buds is worth much more. I think we are worth many, much more than many animals. Um, I think uh, we are made in the image of God, and I think uh, vegans make makes the image of God into a chicken, uh, equal to a chicken or something. What does that mean? Um, God, what, made, what's, God made animals. Yeah, can, and God create. I mean, like, if you're talking about God, again, we don't have proof or evidence, but say... I can give you lots of evidence for God. Well, you haven't yet, but honest point this, is that God created humans and animals, and you're saying that God created humans in his image. What is the image yeah. of God? What is the image of God? We are able to create just like him. We are able to program animals just like him. We can take away their you pain. We're able we to create just like him. That's you can, no, we, it's actually we, very presumptuous to think that we can 
to have power over animals like God, like what, I mean, that, oh, he, where, what's he, the word he can at? take our life without being murder, just like we can take an animal's life without it being murder. Um, there's no murder forcefully, in that. For forcefully what? killing yes. an animal is murder. I mean, an animal I don't agree with that. Die. It doesn't you matter program you them to with it, Martin, because it's a definition of a word. So you can disagree with definitions. And we know that people colloquially use murder to mean human beings, but by definition, it does include animals. Whether you like that or whether you accept it or believe it or not, it's just a fact. And I mean, you're saying that God created human beings. You have no evidence for God. You said Jesus I have ate lots of you have no evidence, evidence for God. For Jesus I said you. I have lots of evidence this for is, God. Okay, so Just, your, what's is, your evidence what for God? Have to do, what we have to do is we have to turn it back into the veganism <laughs> debate because, uh, Martin, to be fair, you had mentioned that you have evidence, but then it's like we haven't really talked about it. And if we're not going to do yeah, it, yeah, but in then that it's going to turn into a. Then it's going to turn into a different debate. Yeah. Uh, but you're bringing up an so, argument about the devaluing of human life using uh, a being that we don't know exists or not. That, that's not great evidence for the debate proposition itself. So how does veganism devalue human life in your opinion? I think it uh, makes a human worth a chicken. It devalues Why? a human to Vegans a chicken. Don't believe because that. Don't so, so how, how much more valuable is a human than a chicken? I don't, we, but again, we don't have to make that decision on an like which chicken and which human. That's such a big that's <laughs> that such chicken a big next statement. to you. <laughs> like, are we talking about Adolf Hitler versus our chicken Antonio? Or are you talking about like two random beings? One is a chicken, one is a human. When in life are we ever going to have to make this choice? Either kill this human or kill this chicken. That's not a choice we have to make in everyday life. No. Yeah, but I'm I'm using uh, a thought processes to figure out how much you value using human a life. A because... process and creating false dichotomies that don't exist in consumers' everyday life. Let's let's but hear. We'll give you just a few minutes. Real quick to interject Martin. Your guide. Martin, we'll give you a few minutes to what, try the... to make your case. Like try, maybe give us something like a almost like a syllogism, like a kind of a more the broad structure of the argument that you have. It will give you just a couple of minutes to spell that out. Uh, justice can go first and then I'll uh, go again. I I've talked too yeah. much now. Just again, no, no, just again right. interject just just again interjecting to what Martin says and again kind of just giving a little bit of pushback um to to what our our interlocutors are saying is that again like making the choice between an animal and a human is not an isolated thought experiment. We do it every single day with experimentation on animals for medical purposes. This is not an isolated thing. And so if we take the veganism position to, you know, humans and animals are e equally valuable or that we should extend the moral cohort to animals as we do to people, then yeah, you are devaluing human life. But then I'll kick it back to Martin and well, maybe you can like James asked, formulate your, your thought a little bit more. If I may quickly respond to what Justice just said, where once again, you're, use, you're saying some human beings in an everyday setting work in research labs where they have to decide what animal experiments to perform on animals in order to legalize drugs or medication or, or do animal testing, that sort of thing. So once again, you are using a fringe example, and then somehow that moves over to, so it's okay if everyone just goes to McDonald's every day and buys hamburgers because these researchers in this one lab or in every lab across the world need to make decisions, then needless decisions are somehow justified. Well, that's why practic possible and practicable are so important in the definition. It's like we know that we cannot delete animal exploitation overnight right now, but we are trying to move away from it. By, by showing people that there is a different way to live. I mean, I grew up eating meat just like everyone else. And mm -hmm. and I, I actually, I mean, I, I learned that, I mean, I loved animals growing up. And then I was like, well, that doesn't make sense. If I love animals, why, are my, why am I causing their suffering? Intentionally causing their suffering. Because I knew that chickens needed to die for me to have chicken. And, 
I mean, it, it's so the value I get out of having a relationship with a chicken, by the way, is so much more than five minutes of taste pleasure that I would have gotten from eating a corpse of a chicken. And right again, I'll, I'm going to kick this back to Martin because that's what James had asked for. But just to, to again, just, just put a final touch on the what you're saying there is that I will grant you. I, I mean, I will even grant you. Let's stop going to McDonald's. It's like I'll grant you. Let's stop buying you know, factory farm meats. If the, if veganism is a, as a protest against factory farming, I'm on board. You know, I'll volunteer for that. But at, veganism as a moral position, as an ethical position, doesn't follow because they're of, of non fringe situations. We have the situation with limes, the situation with animal testing for medication. These are not fringe. These are these are things that that touch all of our lives every day and. Um, I get a huge amount of value out of my horses. I get a huge amount of value out of my goats, both from relationship and from traction power and from food. And I'm sorry for my uh, camera feed dying. I accidentally bumped my bumped my camera and I can't get the feedback. So, but anyway, Martin. Okay. Uh, what I just want to say um, um, that is that I think a person can be too obsessed with animal suffering, just like a person can be not uh, not care about animal suffering, and both is wrong in my opinion. Um, just like if you eat too much, then you'll die, and just if you eat nothing, you'll die. There's a there's a middle point, um, and I think a, a person can make a channel and call it the super annoying vegans, and then tell vegans they don't care enough about. Uh, animals because they have to eat less it's going to cause more, less animal suffering they have to make their houses uh, smaller because it's going to cause less animal suffering and they have to research about each vegan food because each vegan food causes animal suffering so we have to go with the food that um, causes the less um, least amount of animal suffering and you're forced to eat that if you really care about animals and you have to feel bad if you if you don't eat that it doesn't matter how bad it tastes you have to eat that do you yes. agree that uh, 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 being too obsessed with animal suffering is bad? No. How can you be? <laughs> can you be too obsessed with human suffering? Can you be too obsessed with it? If you if you are too obsessed with animal suffering, then you will just. Uh, uh, Do you think it's possible yourself? to be too obsessed with the suffering of humans? Yes. You do. Yes, it, I told you at the beginning you can you can brainwash a person into uh, caring so much about human suffering that they think it's child abuse to bring a human into the world because they don't want the child to suffer or a person to suffer. They almost guaranteed to suffer. So you'd be okay with someone knowingly buying products, you know, of like buying human products instead of animal products, knowing that humans suffered to produce those products because we just can't care that much about human suffering. No, that's not what I said. I said well, that's what people are doing in the animal context. So you have to put it in the same context. People are buying the products of animal suffering. They're buying the corpses of animals. Murder victims so, uh, that have been chopped up and served in grocery stores. That's what people are buying. If they were doing that in the human context, you would be appalled. You wouldn't be saying, hey, guys, we can't be concerned with human suffering all the time. Like a little bit of a little bit of human I'm, I'm just saying extremes are bad. You can be so obsessed with veganism suffering is not that extreme. Veganism is simply some exactly vegans are extremes. Are the same, just to, like just to hear chicken. the rest. Just to hear the rest from uh, Martin. Go ahead, Martin. Mm -hmm. Some vegans are super extreme. They want to kill humans that kill other animals. They want to call uh, humans that murderers that kill other animals. They they get angry and ha put hate on people. For killing animals that's crazy talk in I my opinion i think it's okay to feel angry it's okay to feel angry and frustrated and it feels hopeless sometimes because i see what i see today in the world that i live in is people putting themselves on this pedestal where we think we can just insert ourselves put our hands in everything that has to do with this planet and its beautiful nature and and we're destroying it like if we continue doing what we're doing right now, this planet is, it's, the planet's not going to die. We are going to die. But, you know, I just see people not caring enough is the problem. Mm -hmm. I, I, I wish people cared more. I wish people could live in harmony with the animals on this planet. And like, they're, I mean, I consider them my brothers and sisters. Why, 
why do I not owe them respect? Mm -hmm. It's easy to respect an animal while still respecting, because people say that a lot. Oh, you can't care about multiple. If you care about yeah. animals, you, why don't you, you care about, why the... don't you care about this or that? Yeah. Why aren't you fighting for, for children in Siberia or Siberia, Syria, <laughs> Syria. Sorry. Yeah. If there are, it is possible to care for multiple issues at once. There's room in my heart for all. I mean, and, well, so is your argument that because some vegans care too much about animals, that devalues human life? Like, is that the reason why veganism devalues human life? That's one of the reasons. But not all vegans think that you should just end your life to cause zero suffering. That's actually not the vegan position at all. The vegan yeah, that's not what I said. I said uh, vegans, I've seen lots of vegans hate people for killing animals. And I've seen lots of meat eaters people. hate people too. It's not a product of eating meat. It's a product of the human being, the individual having a personality. The, the, the vegan, veganism itself is simply the doctrine that man should live without exploiting animals. That's it. We just, we, we want to treat cows, pigs, chickens, goats, sheep, the same as we treat cats and dogs. That's what we want to do. Yeah, I, I agree that it's good to care about animals. I just say that you can go to extreme with caring too much about animals and then hating humans for it and devaluing humans and putting the but image of God into a chicken. Not, and and it's essential to vegan. Hating humans is not entailed in veganism. No, I agree. Okay. But it okay, can then. cause All it. Right. It <laughs> can. It conceded. It, no, no, I, I agree. It's like, uh, but it, it causes that. If you if you are super obsessed with animal suffering, then it causes hate towards humans, and you you classify them as murderers, and you would want them to go to jail for killing an animal for food, stuff like that. That's you and you also said, cause animal suffering. You said no to that. Yeah. I mean, you're talking to two vegans who don't hate humans. So I mean, it's anecdotal clearly, but we're going by the definition of veganism. Veganism does not entail hating humans. You can love animals and you can love humans simultaneously. One does not devalue the other. No, and not forgetting I've... that most vegans were meat eaters. It's very rare that someone grew up vegan these days. I mean, we were there too, and we just changed our minds. And now we're trying to inform people, hey, listen, there's this different way of living if you hadn't thought about it before. If you love animals, if you care about animals, it is possible to live, you know, mm -hmm. we're, we're what, six years in, mm -hmm. we're not ghosts, we're alive. I think at one point you said, <laughs> beacons are early, die. I don't know what it was, but I was like, we're, we're here, we're doing well, and it is possible. There are, there are, I mean, we don't touch on the medical stuff because that's not our field. We refer to the, the health, health, based. The health based stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's not our field. We refer to the professionals for that. And, um, but we have, it is, what is the study that a plant-based diet, it is possible to live a healthy lifestyle on a plant-based diet. Yeah. That's according to the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, but those are non-vegan health professionals and we're not health professionals. Yeah, and what I, what another point is veganism food still causes massive amounts of suffering. So if we you want to reduce suffering, uh, eat less, okay? And <laughs> so but you can go crazy like that, eat less. Reduction. Veganism is about not exploiting living beings. So we know crop deaths occur. We know the majority of crop deaths occur in animal products. So the, the way to get rid of the majority of crop deaths is to not eat animal products. So we're, we're doing what we can, but it's not, veganism is not a, a mentality that seeks to reduce harm because like you said, if it were, everyone would just not exist because that would reduce the most amount of harm. Veganism is against animal exploitation. That's what we're against. Justice? Yeah, yeah. And, and again, like I was saying, uh, veganism devalues human life because it extends moral rights that by their very nature are exclusive to humans and humans being Boy, unique. Like which right? And veganism, veganism, just, just one second, is a, even, even if you were to extend those rights, veganism as a goal is self-contradictory because 
you want to do the planet a good a good you like save the planet ecology and all that but by dividing animal husbandry from plant agriculture or plant husbandry you actually make this whole food system unsustainable um so even as an end goal it's it's uh devalues human life justice do you think it is do you disagree okay so i i would imagine that the animals you keep you treat them well Right. We try yeah. to make every day of their life the best day until the last day. Right. So why is it that we draw the line <clears throat> at, at, you know, every people seem to consider <coughs> animal welfare. Uh, people take animal welfare seriously, even people who consume meat. It is animal welfare is important to them up until it comes up until the day of killing them against their will. I mean, don't you, you talked about rights. Why do, do, you, do you think an animal, do you think animals should be allowed their basic right to life uh, or the, and a base, the right to live a life free of suffering? Isn't that everyone's I think that how we treat, right? Again, uh, like with the, the example that I was showing from William Wilberforce and his drive to for the humane treatment of animals at the same time as he was working for the abolition of slavery, the, the old or, or appropriate contextualized understanding of the humane treatment of animals has human interests in the center. So I treat my animals well because it reflects well on who I am as a person. And it has let, l less to do with, with them as it has to do with the, the person. Um, we want to so treat, you don't our treat animals your animals well for them. We don't treat the animals well for them. No, we because we eat them eventually, you know. So it's not it's not a consideration. It's not a consideration for them. It's a consideration for for me. I don't want to torture so you animals could just because beat, that you could just damages beat my soul. Animals willy nilly, and you wouldn't see a moral issue. No. Just like beating the crap yeah. out of your animals on a daily basis. No, the same thing, same reason why I wouldn't beat the crap out of my car or beat the crap out of my house because it reflects poorly on my soul. It does damage to me as an individual. But does it um, like your car because not alive? Well, you're right. And, and I also, agree. Why, why my car is not alive, but but anger and rage and those kinds of emotions that I express damage my soul just as much as they if I kick the dog. And so you that you is, work for the humane treatment of animals um, because it reflects either properly or poorly on your soul. Just like it says in Proverbs, the righteous man takes care of his animals. Um, that just seems so that's, wildly. That's what, then then yeah. forget all that right. when it comes time to kill them like against that, their will. Yeah, that just seems wildly egotistical. Like I, you don't harm others because you don't want to look bad. I don't beat Brian because it reflects poorly on me, not because it hurts Brian. Right. The reason I don't punch other humans is because they wouldn't like it. It's not not about me. The relate the relationship the other human between being humans and humans. The, the relationship between humans and humans is always human centric. The relationship between humans and animals also to not devolve into a quagmire of irreconcil irreconcilable logical fallacies also has to be human centric. Um, why? And that's why. Why? Because why can't we care about animals for animals' sake? because of the, the things that you guys already admitted that for instance, someone who has Lyme disease, who can't get it cured another way is not condemned for eating animals for six months or the people and who you use condemn someone for testing for someone in self-defense. I don't no, I don't kill it for, for killing someone. Okay. In then. No, so that's the fringe not. example. Your but, but, but I, but I would, I would condemn someone who, for instance, needed a kidney transplant and went and killed someone for a kidney transplant. That would be, I would condemn him for that. So your it's a false equivalency when you try to bring that, that into a self-defense into the question. The question would be, if I was sick, do I kill animals to help myself get better? If I am sick, can I kill people to help me get better? And the answer in the one is yes. And the answer in the second is no.
And our question to you is, why is it okay to kill the animals and not the humans? Because animals do not have the same value as humans. According and to who? Humans are more valuable, according to my worldview, according to the Bible, according to the judeo Well, the Bible is irrelevant. Which, the Bible is just a book written back you know, that, by someone. It, the Bible is irrelevant. We're and, asking... And that's part of what I wish to demonstrate today is that when we abandon the moral framework that we have in the Bible, then we get into these strange humanistic, but actually non-human centered philosophies like can't, veganism, like can't communism, someone be like Christian fascism. Can't, be vegan? can't you be both? Uh, you can be vegan and Christian as a form of protest against animal as a form of protest. farming what do you, what do you or... Mean? Or as a, for dietary reasons, but not for moral reasons. No, you can't just choose to respect God's creation as a Christian. You can't just choose to treat His creation with respect as a Christian. You can't be vegan look, and Christian. If you look, if you being a being a vegan you, is a burden. If you, and if you were and, to okay, sorry, <laughs> go go. Go, go for it, Martin. Okay, Jump I'll, in. I'll, okay, what I want to say is being a vegan is a burden. Uh, God has put no such moral obligation on people. They have absolute freedom to eat whatever they want, any animal that they want. The, no such uh, uh, burden is put on them by God. But you can choose to be vegan and Christian, right? You can choose to do that? Sure, and the Bible uh, says that if a person uh, um, is vegan, then his, his faith is weak. I, I can God go says that it's, if, if a no, the Bible says a person, yes, if he, uh, one person, where only is eats that like, <laughs> Vegans have weak faith. That's in the Bible. Oh, your faith is weak. So obviously that's why you're vegan. <laughs> no, <I'm joking>. um, <laughs> no, Martin, we're asking for the, like the biblical quote that says anything about veganism. I, I was unaware that the Bible said okay. anything about veganism. It says thou shalt not kill, but... Yeah. Okay. Here it says uh, Romans 14. Or uh, an asterisk. So in, in a sense, we are following God's... Yeah, the uh, thou shalt not kill yeah. rule is a pretty big yeah. one. Romans 14, uh, verse 2. One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. Vegans don't eat only vegetables. Yeah, well, I'm just giving an example here. <laughs> well, you're giving a I'm just poor giving an example. example. You're, that's a poor example. The vegans eat many more foods than vegetables. What it... Yeah, I'm just. I, I'm, I'm, I'm confused. Perhaps I made a mistake there. Uh, sorry, the, but uh, the word, the word, the word in Romans that's used as vegetables is actually better translated as food that is grown. So grown food, but like like food that's plant based, not animal based so that martin is actually bringing up a, a good verse um and um I, I so god has put no such commandment on people and i think if someone uh, commands people to not enjoy the gifts that god gave them which is animals foods i think it can uh, turn into uh, a doctrine of demons in my opinion because it's not a command from god at all I, I, Sorry, I'm not I, I just, what, what's that? No, I'm just, go ahead. Oh. I, I just, I still don't understand. I, I haven't been presented with, with great arguments or evidence as to why simply treating a non-human with respect means that you're devaluing a human. I don't know why you can't do both. Mm -hmm. you, you can value both. I, I don't see the contradiction. If you, if you place, if you place the value on a non-human that is exclusively that it should be exclusively re reserved for humans, then you are by definition devaluing that human. It's but we're like not saying placing human Henry value Ford, on humans. We're just treating them. It's with like saying to uh, it's like it's like saying to Henry Ford uh, about his Model T that no, I'm not going to drive in this car because that would be exploitative to the car. I'm just going to you know pet it and wash it every day and wax it. But, but I'm the never car is not sent exploiting. The car it. cannot experience life subjectively. The car does not have feelings. Yeah, but, the car does not feel joy but, or pain. That's why we uh, care about and, and what I'm saying for their pain ability is, to And what I'm saying, pain is made for our good. Um, sorry, Justice. Do you want to go? No, 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 go for it, Martin. <laughs> okay, pain is made for our, our good to, to protect us. There are children that can't feel pain, and then they destroy themselves. They scratch out their eyes. 
um, and the parents like cry and wish their child could feel pain. So it not only protects us, it's used for our good, it also protects animals. Now we can program animals to not feel pain. We can put the same error that there's in child, some children and put it in animals and then they will also just destroy themselves. So if we want to play God and uh, think uh, animal suffering is such a bad thing, we can program them not to feel suffering. Well, then by that logic, then a, a, a human child who doesn't feel any pain, you can just beat them and hit them and do whatever you want because they don't feel anything. So what's the problem? No, I didn't say that. I no, your that. logic said that. Uh, a logic. No, no. I, I, I think animals feeling pain is a good thing. I do too. Them. It helps them just like it helps yeah. us. Pain yes. is a helpful evolutionary trait that we all share. I agree. That's why plants don't feel pain because they can't move out of the way. So there was no reason for them to evolve the sensation of pain. But yes, animals do feel pain. And it is wrong to cause them needless pain, just like it is wrong to cause a human needless pain. Justice, you got And again, may, like, like, in the, in the next again, few minutes, we may like, go into the Q&A. Just want to let you guys know that. And folks, if you have a question, feel free to fire it into the old live chat. Our guests are linked in the description. we give you guys several more minutes just to draw together some of the threads from the discussion. Yep. And again, like what I was saying about from the beginning, that veganism as a as a philosophy, as a worldview, as a moral position devalues human life because it because it extends to non humans rights and considerations that should be exclusive to uh, to humans, just like with the analogy with the Henry Ford and the Model T. Um, so the animals should be treated. But, but sentience sentience is not it i mean so so what so it is sentient that's if we make a computer sentient then then do we have to you know value it as much as um a horse or as much as a child or as much as me or as much as you no of course not um and because there we're talking about non-human animals the 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 demarcation is human or non-human and yes that is species and absolutely i'm a you know that's an absolute species position because we need to work on at least getting our human brothers and sisters up to a level of dignity and for 50 percent of the planet that means eating you know animal products as a necessity of life Go ahead. okay i mean I guess if we're wrapping, yeah, we're wrapping up. I mean, the, the debate proposition was, does veganism devalue human life? Um, veganism is simply the belief that non-human animals should not be exploited needlessly. So the only arguments we've heard in, during this debate is that veganism extends rights that should be reserved for humans to non-human animals. But I haven't heard an argument as to why those rights should only be reserved for animals other than vaguely god said so sort of or god made us in his image and we never defined what god's image was we never it is possible like, to extend we never... rights to both humans and animals alike yeah without and... taking anything away from the humans just because you know i respect animals doesn't mean i don't respect uh the black lives matter movement or uh i don't support of uh, feeding hungry children in parts of the world where they don't have uh, where they where there's food insecurity things mm. like that it's possible to care about multiple issues at once and not one takes anything away from the other mm. in fact if anything it informs the other it it encourages compassion and empathy and understanding things that we really need right now mm -hmm. You got it. We are going to jump into the Q&A, folks. We want to say thank you so much for your questions. Thanks for hanging out with us. And if you haven't heard, if you've been living in a cave on Mars with your fingers in your ears, today is our 12-hour debate stream. No joke. We have four debates within this 12-hour stream that we're doing today. So if you just got here, hey, we're going to be here all day. In particular, me, it is going to be a blast. And so... Let's jump into those questions. I want to remind you, our guests are linked in the description. We really do appreciate them as they are the lifeblood of the channel, folks. And so, as always, I want to encourage you to attack the arguments, not the person. And Pancake of Destiny, thanks for your question, says language filter is bad. I don't remember what that would refer to in what came up. Language filter? Yeah, I'm confused. Anybody mm. else get it? Okay. Prince Vegeta, thanks for your question, said just showing some support for the show. They're, Thank they're you, probably. Prince. 
They're probably saying that I speak bad English. Maybe. I don't know. But Silver Harlow, thanks for your question as well, says, James, you are a crazy person, but a good kind of crazy. Good luck with this crazy debate marathon. Thank you, Silver. We are pumped for this debate marathon. I've got the coffee made. I'm excited. And Pancake of Destiny says, if we stop eating meat, what you do what do you do with animals? Uh, so namely, like all the uh, kind of cows that might be at factory farms, things like that. Yeah, so obviously, What's the question? if we stop eating meat, what are we going to do with all the animals? Right. So as veganism, the world is not going to go vegan overnight, unfortunately. But as the demand for animal products keeps going down, and it will keep going down, um, then fewer and fewer animals will be bred into existence. Fewer and fewer animal products will be produced. We don't have like 70 billion land animals floating around because they just breed a lot. We forcibly breed them into existence. We forcibly breed animals and take their children from them and kill them so that we can eat them. So as demand goes down, the animal population will go down. Doesn't mean that they'll go extinct. Obviously, we have cats, dogs, rabbits, other animals that we don't exploit, we don't eat, and they still exist. So, yes, if we Thanos snap our fingers and everyone goes vegan overnight, we'd have a problem. But unfortunately... It's not going to happen that way. Gotcha. And thanks for your question. Dado Papanda, appreciate you asking. As I didn't really mention this, want to let you know the schedule, the debate card for today's 12-hour stream. And I want to quick mention these. Black Lives Matter is, in fact, the next topic coming up. And so that's in 45 minutes. That'll start. And then at 5 p.m. Eastern, whether or not there's evidence for intelligent design should be juicy. And then at 8 p.m., yes, Nathan Thompson and T-Jump are squaring off on the shape of the earth. This time, we might finally get our answer. So that will be a lot of fun. (laughs) We'll get to the bottom of that one. But Reverend Elation, thanks for your question, says, Omnivores, the Bible says, quote, forbidding to eat certain foods, unquote, is demonic because God made them good and to be received with thanksgiving. In 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 4. Should Christians follow doctrines of demons? So it, uh, <clears throat> it, I'm not it sure says there that uh, it says there that it's doctrine of demons to command people to not receive and eat food that God gave us to be received with thank, thanksgiving. God gave no command for us to not eat animal foods. This is interesting. Yeah, and I would uh, also say I would also say that that is another reason why uh, Christians cannot be vegans as a moral position. They can be for dietary reasons or for protest, but not for moral reasons. Otherwise, they fall into doctrines of demons. Super mm. interesting. So I've, I'll give you Anna and uh, Brian. If you want a chance to respond, you can. But because uh, basically, this almost seemed like a softball in favor of Martin and Justice. Like they're agreeing with you guys. I've never heard this idea, namely the. You know, for example, like in Acts 10, when God says, uh, according to Acts 10, it says that you can eat anything. I Usually I've heard that in the context of relative to the Old Testament. I've never heard it be used against vegans. <laughs> but anyway, so Anna and Ryan, if you want to respond, we'll give you a chance to respond. Because like I said, that, that one was kind of a softball in favor of Martin and uh, Justice. Uh, I mean, assuming that an all-knowing, all-loving creator created us and these animals with the ability to feel pain and joy and suffering, and if we are to believe that what he wants us to do is he wants us to forcibly breed them into existence. Like, and then, literally act yes, like, God, like gods. And then like a god. kill them as babies against their will to eat their corpses. Um, if he's mad at me for not doing that, I think that's okay. Gotcha. Now, this one is Pancake of Destiny. Sorry, they said language filter is bad. The reason they said that wasn't to make fun of your English justice. It was instead because they were trying to put in a question, (laughs) but there are certain words YouTube won't allow in the super chats. So, Bocage, thank you for your question. So, you guys think that if I eat tofu instead of a steak, human value just magically decreases like that just uh, just like that. This is ridiculous. 
no, let's get some let's get some justice on that one. Um, <laughs> the the just and righteous answer to that question is that no, of course not. Eat tofu as much as you want. The problem is is when you say that it is immoral to eat meat, um, and when you begin to raise the status of animals into the level of humans, then you devalue you you make less valuable human value because chickens and babies are not equally valuable. Gotcha. And this one coming in from Silver Harlow, appreciate it, said, Brian, definitions are not facts written in stone. A dictionary can only describe how people use words and can do so incompletely. It is reasonable to argue that someone is using a word too broadly. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I agree with the, um, the Matt Dillahunty uh, belief that language is our bitch. And so, you know, we can, we can change and modify language as we see fit because we invented it so we can change it. But as it exists right now, there is a definition of the word murder that means to wantonly kill, to intentionally kill. I mean, that, it's there. that, that is a definition of murder. Now I know people that makes people feel uncomfortable, just like forcefully impregnating an animal that's called rape, but people don't like that word because it makes them feel bad. So it doesn't really matter how it makes you feel. The act is the same. We're talking about the act. The act meaning you're intentionally killing an animal against their will. So we can phrase it like that. You know, is it moral to intentionally kill an animal against his or her will just so you can eat their corpse? I mean, that's just a much longer <laughs> version. Gotcha. And thank you very much for your question. This one coming in from Mark Reed says, Vegans, do you value humans over animals in any aspect? Would you choose an animal to die so a human could live? For example, production of insulin. Well, I think we've already answered that. Yeah. I mean, we are not, we, I mean, that was one of the first things I answered in the debate. Um, but again, to reiterate, we are trying to move away from methods that are used currently that exploit animals, that cause animals great suffering uh, we're trying to move away from that, and I think it is possible. You know, it's not overnight, but people are getting smarter every day, every decade, mm -hmm. um, and we are already moving away from some of those. I mean, if, uh, hu humans. Uh, well, I, I guess I won't bring that up. Just a touch on the second point, real, really quickly. Um, uh, we don't have to make those choices every day in terms of like what, you know, what people put at the end of their forks. That's what we're trying to focus on mainly is, is what people yeah. choose to consume at, when they go to the grocery store. You don't know if you want to add something. No, I just mean, I think, I think forcing this choice that doesn't exist, like, well, would you kill an animal or a human? It's just, it's a false it's a di it's a false dichotomy. I've said it the whole debate. Are there instances where we are forced to make those decisions? Yes. I mean, we but live in a there. house where the drywall drywall is made from animals. Like, like again, the words possible and practicable are very important because there are there animal exploitation. That's what's disappointing. Animal exploitation is everywhere. It's in things that we wouldn't even have expected. Yeah. So we try our best within what we can do you know we it's not possible or practicable for us yeah. to live in a mud hut granted we have one in our backyard but it's not for a living it's a small one uh, but it's not possible and practicable we do what we can yeah within yeah. The, the 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 problem that we have is when people go hey this person over here needs a medication for this medical condition that was tested on animals and then they go therefore I can eat eggs. It's it just doesn't, it's not equal. It's not a great comparison. Gotcha. And this question coming in from Medusa NCO says, for the vegans, how can you keep using the word quote unquote murder when the definition means killing a human? Changing definitions. Let me, let me look it up because I don't think people believe it, us. It doesn't. There is a definition of murder that means to slay wantonly. You can Google it right now. 
You see, there, it. there are multiple definitions for the word murder. Yes, some include the human context. Some include the legal context. Some some instances, it's it's only murder. Merriam-Webster, transitive verb one, to kill a human being unlawfully, unlawfully and with premeditated malice. Two, to slaughter wantonly. Three, to put go. an end to. Tease or torment. I mean, it goes on, but that's one of the definitions. It's right. Merriam-Webster. Not we're not making it up. And again, we could replace. If it makes you feel better about the choices you make every day, <laughs> we're happy to replace murder with kill by force or against their will. <laughs> you got it's, it. It thank comes you. down to the word. Then it's more the meaning that we're yeah, trying to act. convey. You got it. And Jeremy Martin, thanks for your ice cream cone super sticker. Along with the legend Rivs, appreciate your question saying, humans are important for our survival, not an animal's morals. We eat animals, feed the humans, and teach them how to breed more animals. Human rights. We agree. Humans should have rights and non-humans should have rights. That doesn't mean you give non-humans rights. It doesn't mean, oh, humans don't have rights anymore. It's not a hot potato. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. And Ryan Phoenix, Arizona says it dil- the ex- extending rights to non-humans dilutes the value of the rights the humans hold. How? How? Uh, dogs have rights. Again, like uh, c- killing uh, uh, and certain forms of animal abuse in the U.S. are a felony. They were they were written into the into the law. If anyone is caught beating a dog on the street, don't you think people would have something to say about it? Does that mean that the people that the person committing the act of abuse? Is, oh, no, no, no. It's their right to abuse the yeah. dog because it's a dog. You know, did, when when uh, women were granted yeah. the right to vote, we did that devalue men's rights to vote? No, because women are also humans. I think that women are humans. Oh, that's convenient. Once upon a time, we were not considered humans. <laughs> once upon a time, they once were considered upon a equal. Time, uh, people of color were not considered equal. One, this is the thing. When you look at it from the point of view of the oppressor, it is easy now with confirmation bias to be like, oh, well, <laughs> women were always human. But there were people who didn't think we were deserving of those rights once mm-hmm. long ago. Just like we're hoping to move, evolve past the oh, well, animals are not human, so we don't owe them anything. Gotcha, and thank you very much for this question. This one coming in from male user says, how can vegans make a moral argument as moral relativists? They may not like a religious justification for morality, but they cannot offer any non-subjective justification and hence lose by default. (laughs) Well, moral relativity and moral subjectivity are two different things, but... By all evidence that we can observe, all morality is subjective because morality is simply a thing that exists in the minds of Homo sapiens. So if Homo sapiens all went extinct, morality would human morality would also go extinct. So even religious morality, even if you believe things are right or wrong because a god says so, then that's basically just God's subjective opinion of what's right and wrong. It's still subjective. God is a subject. So you're either doing what you believe to be right, like you're doing good things because you believe them to be good, or you're doing good things because you believe this other guy told you to do them because they're good because he subjectively thinks they're good. It's always subjective. It, it, like saying that if God doesn't exist, then objective morality can't exist. That's not actually an argument for objective morality. Gotcha. And this one coming in from Ryan Phoenix, Arizona says sentience is just and made measure, a man-made measure, just as the Bible is. Does Brian have proof that plants aren't sentient? Many believe they are. Some plants eat flies and react to touch. I just well, you can, demonstrate? you can speak on oh. something. Uh, yes, yeah, sentience is the ability to experience life subjectively. So basically what that means is that it feels like something to be someone. So anyone who has a subjective experience uh, has a point of view. They have their own reality, their own way of viewing the world. Um, plants, on the other hand, and, and to the best of our knowledge, according to the Cambridge Declaration on Consciousness, which was written in 2012, um, 
non-human animals also produce also have the same substrates in their brain to produce consciousness so we know for a fact that animals with a brain and a nervous system do experience sentience uh, we to the best of our knowledge sentience comes from having a brain and central nervous system and this celery here has no brain has no nervous system however i can chop it in half and guess what new celery starts to grow. I right. can do that as many times as I want and new leaves will always pop up. You can and do this, that with some animals as well. So, us, <laughs> but yeah. Maybe a Chris, like what were the a starfish, tail, yeah. A, yeah. a lizard's tail, but not most. I mean, I, the, we have a lemon tree outside every single season. It drops lemons on the ground that we eat. The tree doesn't that's what a tree is meant to do. It's meant to spread its seed. Yeah. So we we consume the lemons and the scream does the, the tree doesn't scream. I mean, I would argue that if someone thinks that it's possible for a plant to feel pain, then I would also ask them, is it possible for a plant to have a stomach ulcer? And if the answer is well, no, because they don't have a stomach. Well, then the answer is, well, no, they can't feel pain because they don't have a brain. If, if like plants they're... could feel pain, I mean, I don't see people protesting on the street when the neighbor mows the lawn. You know, it, that's just not a very genuine concern that people have. I mean, if you're driving a car and there's a, a patch of flowers on mm -hmm. the curb and, you know, would you avoid the dog and, and drive into the patch of flowers or, you know? Yeah. This one and if the person asking this question is a plants rights activist, <clears throat> they should still eat a plant-based diet because eating plant-based kills far fewer plants as well. Gotcha. And thank you very much for this question coming in from, you guessed it, male user again says, is it objectively true that it's always subjective? What? Hmm. what is it? Namely that morality is, it, is, it is subjective. <laughs> Oh, oh. Is it objectively true that morality is subjective? To the best of our knowledge, yes. I mean, we can't <laughs> prove it to be objective, yes. Gotcha. And next up, Alex Davenport asks, do you think my wife is less of a vegan for marrying me, who is a meat eater? Does, does your wife, if your wife doesn't exploit animals needlessly, then she's vegan. I mean, that's the definition. Yeah. Gotcha. She, yeah. she Maybe she condones meat eating because she condones your behavior but she's vegan gotcha and this one coming on from bo Cadge says we kill animals for nothing more taste buds is a little bit of taste really worth more than an entire animal's life i think that's for you mm -hmm. justice and martin look you can you can and say the same with like vegans right away again <laughs> go justice <laughs> It's just, um, sorry, my internet lags, so I, yeah. But th the thing I like to say right right away is that the the killing of animals, eating of animals, is not just about taste pleasure. This is a, a myth propagated by by vegan activists. It has to do with ecology. It has to do with sustainable agricultural practices, and it has to do with sustainable food uh, diet for the vast majority of the people that dwell on this planet that doesn't happen to be you and your neighbors because you live in the golden billion but it happens to be the vast majority of all other people who live on the planet so no it's not for just taste pleasure it's for survival and for survival not only of humans but also of the planet if we want to have a stable agricultural system gotcha and yeah this and uh, I just want to add to that. Um, I think you can turn that around against the vegans because their foods also cause animal suffering. So you can go and research which food causes the least amount of animal suffering. It doesn't matter how bad it tastes. You need to eat it. That's the same uh, kind of flow logic. This one coming in from Top Dog Shattuck says, Hey, Martin, what if veganism is the balance that you want? <laughs> if God, uh, let me say this né? if God commanded us to be vegans I would join them 100% I think in heaven everyone's going to be a vegan but that's not now and um, pain there's going to be no pain but that's not now pain is not evil here and eating animals is not evil here can I just say if you believe that heaven, in heaven everyone will be vegan you don't want to bring heaven to earth you're choosing not to bring heaven to earth while you're here 
that's such a, <laughs> such a bizarre choice to make. Like, no, that's like that, that's like saying that's like saying no one's gonna have children on uh, uh, in heaven. Definitely, no one's gonna have children. So don't How do you, you know want that? to bring that to earth and take away all uh, people's ability to have children? Because a child, bringing a child into the world, it's gonna feel pain. So if you're obsessed enough about a child's pain, you would say it's um, child abuse. It's the same kind of craziness. Uh, you would need to provide evidence that people aren't going to have kids in heaven. <laughs> this one coming I mean, in. Think, They're not going to marry or anything. I can't argue this that one. because it's like kind of a mad I don't know what heaven is like. Yeah. I don't know what there is on the other side. This I mean, one coming. argue that? This one coming in from Buck, Buck O'Haram, thank you, says, most vegans I've met are very math, Malthusian. I was vegan for three years. What is that? What does that mean, by the way? Malthusian. I should have looked that up. Malthusian. Hold on, let me look it up. Malthusian. They said I was vegan for three yeah, years, having, so being met like plenty. Malthus, wanting, wanting to kill are humans. Able, are you not able to hear me? Malthusian. Justice. I am sorry. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> so, they said I was vegan for three years, so met plenty. Could you ask these guys if the lowering of human population is a worthy goal? Oh, I think that Malthusian might mean uh, kind of a philosophy of reducing the world's population. Anti-natalism. Anti um, yeah, it says a person who supports the theory of population proposed by... Uh, yeah, the... James, I can hear you. I was just trying to interject. Malthusian has to do with being anti-human and decreasing the population because of the cycles of, of starvation and so forth and so on. Yeah. I don't know why that this was the why guy. that would ever be tied to veganism because again veganism is an animal rights movement so you, vegan is vegan are there vegans who are antinatalist sure are there meat eaters who are antinatalist yes it has nothing to do with veganism itself I'm just reading it says the idea that population growth is potentially exponential while the growth of the food supply or other resources is linear which eventually reduces living standards to the point of triggering, triggering a population die off uh, yes. So I don't know if it's something that naturally happens in that theoretical view or as something that should be forced to happen. That would be a big distinction. Yeah. Um, yeah. But okay. we're not. Malthus, Malthus advocated advocated population control. But yeah. Well, I, I, I don't, don't know that. what that has to do with veganism. By killing humans <laughs> or by not having babies? Different branches of Malthusianism have different things. Some of them would say they'd be anti-natalist, and some of them would say, like, kill the lower classes. But again, what that has to do with veganisms, I don't quite know. Yeah, and this was 1798. What was the population in 1798 that he was so concerned? I mean, this might have had political... I, I would have to read up on this because I've never heard of this term or this viewpoint, but um, it could have had political under... Uh, what do you call it? Uh, interests. <laughs> gotcha. And this one coming in from Brad Burr says, Brian and Anna, why don't the Venus fly traps make more morally responsible food choices? I think they're asking, like, is it unethical well, from your view that they eat flies? Ven mm -hmm. Venus fly traps are not sentient. They're intelligent. If you put... I don't know. This I feel like this. Even this is cruel. But there are people who I've I've seen videos of people putting cigarettes in in Venus flytraps, and they still close their mouths on cigarettes. They'll mm. close their. They, they have sensors, uh, just like um, the dormilonas that we have in Costa Rica. You touch them, and they they close. So like they don't have the ability to make conscious moral choices. Gotcha. But plants are intelligent. And that this. I can see. You got it. And last one, this one coming in from, do appreciate your question, Augmented Space asks, oh, gotcha, it says, Brian, have you ever heard of a, a scream, a, a tree scream in pain when a large limb is torn off of it? I think it's supposed to be a joke from when you hear the wood splitting. Gotcha. And want to say, mm -hmm. folks, so you know, like, yeah, when the wood splits, it makes that squeaky sound. But basically, one, they're, they're being, I think they're being, they're yeah. joking. Uh, but I hope. <laughs> but want to let you know, folks, our guests are linked in the description. Highly encourage you to check out their links. We're extremely thankful for them. And you guys, if you didn't know it, if you just came into the stream late, we're going 12 hours today. This is the first of four debates. The other one's in about 22 minutes. So I'm going to be back with a post credit scene, or you could say in this case, 
an intermission scene where I'll share about stuff with the channel, as well as this juicy debate that you can see on the right side of your screen as we are pumped to have made the 78% mark for that crowdfund. And if you, for example, want to see Peter Sanger on the channel someday, like very famous vegan in the philosophy world. If you'd like to see him, for example, debate on this channel, no joke, this crowdfund mm -hmm. strategy that I'll talk about in the intermission is a very practical strategy. So, and one cool thing is, if you didn't know, I had heard, cause he, our department hosted him a long time ago, Peter Sanger at that time, he would have an honorarium that he would receive and required to speak, but he would give it all to charity. And so, that's something that's cool. I was like, hey, maybe some, maybe someday we'll get there. But that depends on this crowdfund strategy working for us. And so I'll share more about that in a moment. But thanks so much to our guests, Anna, Brian, and Martin and Justice. It's been a true pleasure to have you guys here. Thank you, as always. Thank you, thank you guys always, for the good conversation. Really yeah. yeah. And thank you, Justice and Martin, for hitting us up and actually making the debate happen because so frequently people will do the debate me bro thing and then never actually follow through and make it happen. So we always appreciate the chance to have the debate and we really appreciate you, James, for providing this neutral platform. It's an amazing channel. We watch it all the time and uh, you're one of the more handsome uh, debate moderators on YouTube. I will also say. Thank you, Brian. Seriously, I encourage that. You're, this is the first time I blushed on stream for a while. So thank you. And so, folks, we are thrilled. We appreciate our guests. And as always, we want to let you know, we hope you feel welcome here no matter what walk of life you're from. I'll be right back with that post credit scene in just a moment. <laughs>